Welcome. Um, I'm really delighted and honored to be here. Uh, my name is Rachel Cooper, and I'm uh, from the Asia Society in New York. And I actually had the idea for this panel last year, uh, partly because I was so deeply inspired um, 20 years ago when I met Aga Shahid Ali. And I thought I'd just start the session giving you a little bit of, of what that experience was. I only met him once. I'm not an expert. And it affected me all of these years. Oh, OK. So, um, so as I mentioned, I'm at, in New York at an institution that is educational. And we were doing Mushaira. And I met Shahid at a party. And we were doing programs in Urdu, and all the uh, Americans who came and heard the poetry were uh, mesmerized by everyone saying, wah, 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 wah. But they didn't know really why. They knew it was deeply moving. They didn't know why. So when Shahid and I were talking, he said, well, I have a commitment to writing guzzles in English, because this is a great form. It's one of the great forms in the world. It has so much to say and I want to share it more universally. And at that point, we decided we're going to do a program together. We're going to do a Mushaira, and we're going to bring this form to Americans, and we're going to find a way to do this in English. And he had already started a project, uh, which Chris will talk about in That's a minute. Um, in fact, all of us will. But, but what was so, so tragic was we had this idea, we had this passionate conversation. He, shortly after this, got ill, and he passed away. And we had the Mushaira, but the Mushaira became a memorial to his memory, to his vision. And what has struck me all these years later is slowly but, but consistently, his voice has uh, brought so much to, to uh, poetry in general, you know, globally. And, and his vision of Kashmir, I think, has affected people in a, a different way than the headlines that we often see. So we'd really like to look at that uh, from the perspective of uh, the panelists who are here today. And we're going to start with Chris Merrill, because he knew him so well. They were very close. Uh, and as you may know, Chris is the head of the International Writers Program at the University of Iowa. So Chris. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you all for coming here at the end of this glorious festival. I have to say this would be for Shahid uh, the high point of his life to see uh, readers of his in Lahore. He came to Lahore once. Uh, and indeed, in the book, The Country Without a Post Office, it ends with a poem after the August wedding in Lahore. I think it was uh, uh, one of the most profound experiences of his life. What I'm going to say is that uh, Shahid and I were the best of friends, the closest of friends for about 20 years. And uh, we talked to each other on the phone just about every day, sometimes many times in a day, especially if he was writing a new poem. And uh, the book that we're here to talk about, The Country Without a Post Office, was in certain respects the, the book where he became Aga Shahid Ali. He was, um, until this book, a pretty, you know, standard free verse poet in America. And then the combination of the uh, tragedy in Kashmir and his uh, blossoming friendship with my namesake, the much older formal master, James Merrill, uh, those two things came together in such a way that he became a bigger poet than he was. Um, Rachel talked about his, uh, his challenge to American poets to write, as he said, real guzzles in English. I think this came out of his uh, perhaps a latent uh, un unease with the translations he made of Fez Ahmed Fez, which were pretty, uh, pretty free. I published the book, so I know it really well. Um, and it was sometime after that that he began to think about how to write a real guzzle, 
how to obey the formal strictures, something that uh, some guzzlers in, in, in America in the 60s and 70s, like Robert Bly and Adrian Rich and, James, and Jim Harrison, did not do. So he challenged American poets to write real guzzles in English and compiled a fantastic uh, anthology called Ravishing Disunities. And uh, his last book of poems, Call uh, Me Ishmael Tonight, consists entirely of guzzles, many of which uh, take off from uh, a line from a, an American poet or some poets from abroad who he was particularly attracted to and wanted in his own way to braid their lines together with his. I thought that I would just read a little bit of this poem, uh, which is a prose poem, um, Some Vision of the World Kashmir, which comes from uh, his deep and abiding love of uh, Emily Dickinson. He read Dickinson very closely. He ended up teaching at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst for most of uh, his remaining years, and he was constantly inspired by, uh, by Dickinson. Interestingly enough, uh, when he died in 2000, uh, 2001, uh, he died on December 8th. Uh, of course, by Muslim law, he should have been buried the next day, the 9th, but this was in Massachusetts and Massachusetts still has what we call blue laws, which means you can't do anything. So he ended up being buried on uh, Dickinson's birthday, which I think he would have found, he would have liked that. So some vision of the word world Kashmir, which begins with uh, three lines from Dickinson. If I could bribe them by a rose, I'd bring them every flower that grows from Amherst to Kashmir. And I think that's what he really was doing. So I'm just going to read the first section of this prose poem. It goes, begins like this. But the phone rings here in Amherst. Your grandmother is dying. Our village is across the bridge over the flood channel, the bridge named for Majur. There's no such village. She had a terrible fall. There is curfew everywhere. We have no way to bring her back. There is panic on the roads. Our neighbors have died. There never was such a village. We are your relatives from her mother's mother's side. You've heard of us. We once were traders and sold silk carpets to princes in Calcutta, but now we are poor and you have no reason to leave us. Shah had often described himself as a triple, triple exile, first from Srinagar, then from India, and finally from Urdu into English. When he translated Fez, he had all of Fez by heart, but he had written almost all of his life only in English. He seemed to me to be an ideal translator for that. And I think that there was always this sense that he had left Kashmir and uh, would only go back from time to time in the summer during his vacation from teaching. And that sense of distance, that sent, the sense of the abyss opening up combined with his newfound interest in formal English meters as well as in the guzzle made for an absolutely <coughs> thrilling book in the country without a post office. Thank you, Chris. Um, there's a, I just wondered if you could, could bring a, your sense of um, Shahid, who I, I know you, you didn't meet and yet I think had a, a profound influence on you. Maybe you could tell a little bit of that story and, and bring his voice uh, through a different poem. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and, and thank you, Lahore. Uh, it's been brilliant. Um, uh, can I read the poem first? Because this poem has a particular personal resonance for me, and I'll, go, I'll talk about it briefly after I read the poem. Is that OK? Uh, this is I See Kashmir from New Delhi at Midnight. One must wear jeweled ice in dry plains to will the distant mountains to glass. The city, from where no news can come, is now so visible in its curfewed night that the worst is precise. From Zero Bridge, a shadow chased by searchlights is running away to find its body. On the edge of the cantonment where Gupkar Road ends, it shrinks almost into nothing, is nothing by interrogation gate, so it can slip unseen into the cells. Dripping from a suspended burning tire are falling on the black 
Drippings from a suspended burning tire are falling on the back of a prisoner, the naked boy screaming, I know nothing. The shadow slips out, beckons, console me. And somewhere there, across 500 miles, I'm sheened in moonlight in emptied Srinagar, but without any assurance for him, on residency road by Mir Pan House. Unheard we speak. I know those words by heart. You once said them by chance. In autumn, when the wind blows sheer ice, the chinar leaves fall in clusters, one by one otherwise. Rizwan, it's you, Rizwan, it's you, I cry out, as he steps closer, the sleeves of his ferrant torn. Each night put Kashmir in your dreams, he says, then touches me, his hands crusted with snow, whispers, I have been cold a long, long time. Don't tell my father I have died, he says, and I follow him through blood on the road and hundreds of pairs of shoes the mourners left behind as they ran from the funeral, victims of the firing. From windows we hear grieving mothers and snow begins to fall on us like ash. Black on edges of flames, it cannot extinguish the neighborhoods, the homes set ablaze by midnight soldiers. Kashmir is burning. By that dazzling light, we see men removing statues from temples. We beg them, who will protect us if you leave? They don't answer. They just disappear on the road to the plains, clutching the gods. I won't tell your father you have died, Rizwan. But where has your shadow fallen, like cloth on the tomb of which saint, or the body of which unburied boy in the mountains, bullet torn like you, his blood share rubies on Himalayan snow? I have tied a knot with green thread at Shah Hamdan, to be untied only when the atrocities are stunned by your jewel return. But no news escapes the curfew nothing of your shadow, and I am back 500 miles, taking off my ice, the mountains, granite, again, as I see men coming from those abodes of snow with gods asleep, like children in their arms. I read this poem in a photocopied version of, of the book when I was a student in Delhi. I was a young student in Delhi, and I hadn't read Shahid until then, and someone distributed a copy of this. And I remember I had a visceral reaction to, to this poem in particular, also country read or the, the, the title poem as well, because it was the first time someone was speaking to me directly about what we had seen. I had just come to Delhi from Srinagar. I spent a good part of my you know, teenage years, youth, in, in, in Kashmir. And when I read Shahid for the first time, I had a visceral reaction because there was this somebody was finally speaking to us about what had just happened because we, you're young. You don't know how to process what's just happened, what's happened to you, to your people, to your family, to your neighborhood. And then there is this poem, and it was, I remember it was a dazzling light. It was literally somebody shining a light on the darkness we had seen. And sometimes I like to think I am a writer, if not entirely because of Shahid, but a large part goes back to that time when me and Bashar Atpi, my friend, and other writers in Kashmir, we read Shahid because he was the first sort of writer. And what also happens is this sense of expectation then, because then we thought, okay, here is this, this is a dream prophet who will now tell the world about us. So my sort of journey, if I trace my uh, journey of being a writer, it goes back obviously to childhood and everything, but also to the moment Shahid arrives in, in, in my life. It's um, it just I'm so struck by how uh, powerful his voice is and how okay. it feels of this very moment in, in as powerfully as it did, you know, when he wrote it. I think, yeah, that's, and that's, the great that's, tragedy of that yeah. is its currency. Yeah, he's, he's relevant, yeah, evermore. Yeah. Um, should I, can we talk a little bit about the guzzle, about the form, and, and perhaps how you have been um, influenced by, by Shahid's work and, and how that carries forward? Okay, so the very first time I encountered uh, Shahid was when I was an undergrad student at Reed College. And my professor, Andre Cole, said, um, he just gave me the nostalgist's map of America, and he said, here, you speak Urdu, and you write in English, and here's our Kashmiri-American poet who has the same background as you, 
and you might find this interesting. So I read the book, and I was fascinated by Shahid's use of, um, uh, so this book is, is, is um, um, set in, in the desert of Arizona in Tucson, and, um, um, but the landscape is infused with um, these ideas from, or these images from the Arab Persian Urdu tradition <laughs> of um, uh, the lore of Lela and Majnun. And there are a lot of ideas that are uh, uh, mis mystical uh, in nature. And he brings together Emily Dickinson and um, you know, this tradition of mystic thought. And, and he does it in a very abstract way. So I liked the book, I enjoyed it, and I was fascinated by how he was doing it. Um, and um, for a while, you know, I didn't read much of Aga Shahid Ali, and um, I, I, re, um, uh, the, the, uh, I rediscovered Aga Shahid Ali when I was a student um, uh, at Warren Wilson, where he taught as well. So, so there was a gap um, of many years where I didn't read Aga Shahid Ali. And um, it's interesting that when you trace his journey as a poet, you see that his, um, his, he's an exile, he's a poet of exile, and when he talks about exile, it's exile from Kashmir, but he enlarges the idea of exile. Kashmir is a metonym for paradise. That's what it is. And his exile is of the same um, magnitude as Adam's exile from paradise. And so he brings in these ideas that are part of the, um, um, the Judeo-Christian and the Islamic traditions, and he creates this whole lexicon, even before he introduced the ghazal with its um, former, uh, formal constraints and all that as, as, a, um, you know, um, as a poetic form, he was, he was uh, sort of progressing towards that. And for years and years, um, he wrote about Kashmir uh, from the point of view of, um, as a microcosm, really, of the larger Islamic tradition, um, of the aesthetic tradition, which includes not only poetry, uh, but also weaving. Uh, he talks about um, embroidery and the, tr the rich tradition of weaving silk and wool and, and cotton. Um, you know, the beautiful book, uh, poem about um, the Dhaka gauzes. Um, and he brings a whole lexicon into the American canon, um, even before he starts talking about the ghazal as a form. So it really was a progression from giving the larger um, language to, to even begin talking about the ghazal. So his last collection is call, call Me Ishmael Tonight, which is a posthumous collection, and it's a collection of ghazals. And so if you see, um, um, the, his earlier work, and you see his posthumous collection, you see how it was such a natural and organic thing for him to enter the ghazal form, because the ghazal is about loss, longing, and the beloved. And all of that is so beautifully combined um, in, the, um, in his attachment and his love for Kashmir. So, thank you. Um, I'm going to read five couplets from his poem. It's a ghazal, and the radif is land. And um, as you know, uh, and as Chris explained, that the ghazal was being written in the US um, decades before um, Shahid taught us how to write it properly. Um, and he called his first anthology ravishing disunities, real American ghazals. So he taught us that there's a kafia and a radif and a tachallus, and um, th there is no thematic unity, but there is sonic unity. And um, you have to learn to appreciate the ghazal. The reader has to bring some, some knowledge of the, the form and the aesthetics before um, they can approach the ghazal. So I'm going to read five couplets from um, this ghazal, the Radif is land, 
And um, I'm going to read it in the traditional Urdu style. So you'll hear the first line of each couplet twice. Swear by the olive in the God-kissed land. As you know that this is actually a direct quote from the Quran. Swear by the olive in the God-kissed land. There is no sugar in the promised land. If home is found on both sides of the globe, if home is found on both sides of the globe, home is of course here and always a mist land. Clearly, these men were here only to destroy. Clearly, these men were here only to destroy. A mask, now the dust of a prejudiced land. Is my love nothing, for I've borne no children? Is my love nothing, for I've borne no children? I'm with you, Sappho, in that anarchist land. And this last one. A hurricane is born when the wings flutter. A hurricane is born when the wings flutter. Where will the butterfly on my wrist land? Rachel, can I say a word about that poem? Because it might be interesting for you to know how it came about. Um, when I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia, Shahid was always saying to me, when you're done with that, you need to go to Kashmir. But what I was doing in those years was I would go to visit, to house sit the house of uh, the American poet W.S. Merwin, a poet that Shahid and I revered. He had a house of 19 acres on Maui in Hawaii, and it was a kind of botanical preserve which Shahid and I referred to as the promised land. And as I said earlier, we talked all the time. And he called me one day, and I knew that we were going to have a long conversation. So I thought I would go make a cup of tea. Now, I need to tell you that Merwin is a devout Buddhist. So when I was looking around his kitchen, there was no sugar. And I said to Shahid, there's no sugar in the promised land. And he said, that's a great line for a guzzle. So then we started playing around and uh, swear by the olive in the God-kissed land began actually as swear by the olive in the sun-kissed land, mm. which at the time, sun-kissed was a very popular brand of orange juice. And I said to Shahid, I think that might sound a little bit like uh, an advertisement. <laughs> and then we got to the Quran and the poem began to take off and we challenged each other to write such a poem. That's how. That's how that began, and the guzzle chain that we put together as he was dying began with uh, swear by the olive in the God-kissed land. There's no sugar in the promised land, swear by the olive in the God-kissed land. And it ended, uh, 200 poets contributed couplets to it, and it ended with uh, Shahid's uh, signature couplet. At the moment the heart turns terrorist, are Shahid's arms broken, O promised land? I thought that might be interesting for you. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you for that. I want to clarify that swear by the olive is the part that's from the Quran. So the rest of the, <laughs> it's, it's a phrase that's in the Quran. Yeah. Just to clarify. Shaista, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could kind of put this in a larger perspective from the standpoint of literature and, and your, per, your view on, on how he fits into the larger canon. Kashmir is, um, I think some of us are here because uh, it's something that many of us have grown up with as a sort of open wound. Um, and we are probably going to end our lives, some of us, not everybody in this hall, uh, with that wound still open. Um, and I was just thinking when I was reading um, Agha Shahid Ali's poetry, how this image of the the uh, of Kashmir, really, in a sense, Kashmir uh, encapsulates um, various areas in the world which have been torn by uh, violence and war. Mm -hmm. And he actually talks about Sarajevo. He talks about Chechnya. 
um, he talks about Bosnia. And I was just thinking, you know, like you, you have a list of all these terrible places and you keep ticking things off and Kashmir is still the wound right. which is open. Um, and in his poetry, um, you have this sense of somebody who is within the frame that is of, of Kashmir, uh, but also outside. And so he uh, recurringly uh, uh, in, in the poems, there will be images of mirrors and of reflections. Right. Um, and the question, one of the, 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 the question, the painful question which he raises is, um, is it right for art to address something which is as raw and as painful? Um, and, um, you know, he, um, he talks about so many different aspects of Kashmir. He talks about the beauty of Kashmir, uh, but it is, as we know, both beautiful and benighted. It seems to be singularly benighted in its beauty. Um, and he, there is a poem in which he's quoted from Easter 1916, yet says Easter 1916, um, uh, a terrible beauty is born. I think in, in the case of Kashmir, uh, terrible beauty is being born, but it is also being buried mm -hmm. uh, in the same breath. Um, there are, his poems are full of images that are to do with what is redolent and what is beautiful about Kashmir, the chanars, the lotuses, the olives, the, the, the mustard, the sarson. Uh, in fact, a, um, uh, a, 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 anyway, I'm sorry, I won't share that because it's, it's not in very good taste. Um, um, all that is put then juxtaposed with, um, you know, all the, 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 the burning and the images of violence, the khaki, the trucks, the fires, the uh, the flames clinging to a torched village. Um, this And the way that he stitches together then, uh, keeping in a sense the tradition of weaving and, and uh, you know, weaving shawls with the paisley design, uh, he stitches the images in one song. Um, uh, the, 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 this quotation is not from Shahid, it is from uh, Derek Walcott, and he's talking about Homer and how Homer is able to stitch mm -hmm. all these songs uh, together. And I think that there is that process of stitching and, and uh, in a sense, creating a new tapestry, creating a new shawl. And I see that there are references to Greek classical, well, to, to, to drama. There is a poem about Iphigenia. And, um, and then, of course, there is the haunting presence of the ferryman, right. the postman, the Mali, who has disappeared when he goes back to Harmony's Three, which was this little enclave of three homes uh, that his family had lived in. Um, and as I said, the, the, the question that comes back to haunt him is this, oh, of what shall I sing? and not sing. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how, um, in a sense, words are nothing, just rumors, mm -hmm. like roses to embellish a slaughter. And in this context, I was thinking about two poets um, from the West who have written about um, countries, lands, human beings uh, in terrible strife and war-torn areas. And um, the first is Evan Boland. And in her collection, In a Time of Violence, um, she again talks about this whole business of, you know, does art embellish to the point of an untruth or does art speak a truth beyond the reality. Um, and uh, one of her uh, poems, which is called uh, Time and Violence from this collection, she says about the characters in the poem, she says, write us out of the poem. Make us human 
in cadences of change and mortal pain, and words we can grow old in and die in. Um, and then she also, in, a, in, a, in another poem, says, show me the obduracy of an art which can arrest a profile in the flux of hell, inscribe catastrophe. Uh, catastrophe. And I think that this is something that the poems uh, uh, that we, you know, you have read, Agha Shahid Ali's poems, they do try and navigate a path, um, a, a language, really, uh, to both express pain, but also to recognize poetry as poetry, and words as words. Uh, and uh, it's not really a competition of what is, which is better or which is worse, the reality or, 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 or language or the language of art, but the fact that in a sense they are two different worlds, but because they are different, they are also related. And that sense both of distance, his own personal distance from the place, whether it is in an aeroplane or it's sitting in New Delhi or he's here in Lahore. Um, and um, the prognosis, incidentally, for that wedding in August doesn't seem to be a very cheerful one for the couple because they seem to have embarked on another journey of pain, uh, which is an unusual poem uh, about uh, the aftermath of a wedding, but maybe that's how one is left feeling at the end of many weddings. Um, <laughs> um, I was, uh, excuse me, am I over taking too much time? No, nope, it's fine. I think I'll have to be written out of this lecture, otherwise I'll go out still lecturing. <laughs> I'd just like to read uh, this poem where, again, the, the second poet I was thinking of uh, was Seamus Heaney. And the word uh, that occurs in one of his poems in North is omphalos. And omphalos, which is the navel or the center, is something that Srinagar and Kashmir are for Agha Shahid Ali. Omphalos in the, in the best sense, in the sense that that is the core, that is something that keeps you together, it's your anchor. Um, and I think that this is something that he then, uh, the, the, the omphalos is to be found in the home. So the poem is Return to Harmony Three. Two summers, epochs, then of ice, but the air is the same muslin, beaten by the sky on Nanga Parbat, then pressed on the rocks of the nearest peaks. I run down the ramp on the tarmac, I eavesdrop on Operation Tiger. Troops will burn down the garden and let the haven remain. This is home, the haven, a cage surrounded by ash, the fate of paradise. Through streets strewn with broken bricks and interrupted by paramilitaries, Irfan drives me straight to the Harmonies Three, for my father, the youngest brother, three houses built in a pastoral that walled acreage of harmonies where no one but my mother was poor. A bunker has put the house under a spell. Shadowed eyes watch me, open the gate like a trespasser. Has the gardener fled? The annex of the harmonies is locked. My grandmother's cottage where her sons offered themselves to her as bouquets of mirrors. There was nothing else to reflect. Under the windows, the roses have choked in their beds. Was the gardener killed? And the postman? In the drawer of the cedar stand, peeling in the veranda a pile of damp letters. The one to my father to attend a meeting, the previous autumn, another in invitation to a wedding. My first key opens the door. I break into quiet. The light works, lights work. The Quran still protects the house, lying strangely wrapped in a Jamavar shawl where my mother had left it on the walnut table by the fireplace. Above it, above, if God is with you, victory is near. The framed calligraphy, ruthless behind cobwebs. 
I pick up the dead phone, its number exiled from its instrument, a refugee among forlorn numbers in some angry office on Exchange Road. But the receiver has caught a transmission, Rafi's song from a film about war. Slowly, so, I so slowly keep on walking and then was severed forever from her. This is All India Radio, Amritsar. I hang up. Upstairs, the window too is a mirror. If I jump through it, I will fall into my arms. The mountains return my stare, untouched by blood. On my shelf by Ritzos and Rilke and Kavafi and Lorca and Iqbal and Amachai and Paz, my parents are beautiful in their wedding brocades, so startlingly young. And there in black and white, my mother, 18 years old, a year before she came, a bride to these harmonies, so unforgivingly poor and so unforgivingly beautiful that the house begins to shake in my arms and when the unarmed world is still again with pity, it is the house that is holding me in its arms and the cry coming faded from its empty rooms is my cry. Somehow there's something about hearing poetry that is unlike reading it. And um, it's really um, wonderful to hear all four of you reading his words and, and, um, and hearing that together. Um, Here's I'm just wondering when you when you talk about how this set you off on a trajectory, what does that mean? How how did it have that effect, and and how does that affect your own interpret your own writing? Uh, can I go back briefly to what you were talking about? And he's, she was absolutely right. Shahid knew very early on what he was doing. He had no doubt what he was doing. And you know there have been attempts in the past to uh, sometimes. Uh, not talk about, not talk enough about the politics in the poetry. Uh, bit, there have been attempts to, to, to just dwell on the aesthetics. Right. And Shahid wouldn't have liked it at all because he was very, very clear about what he was doing. There's a recording you must find on the internet and if you don't, I'll, you know, I'll find it for you. It's from 1996. There's a young Shahid reciting his poem, his signature poem in Delhi. It's a private recording. He begins the record recitation with this line, I love India but I am deeply, deeply upset and troubled by its actions in Kashmir. I do not like it at all. And then he begins his, his whims. So yeah, he had no doubt. Once he was asked by Amitav Ghosh once, he was asked, and I'll quote, he was asked uh, that you're the closest thing to being Kashmir's national poet. And Shahid agreed with this, but he also added, I wouldn't like to be called a nationalist poet. And that, for me, sort of sums up Shahid's persona in terms of his approach to his own work. He had no doubt what he was doing. For him, that you know, the sometimes crude binary between politics and aesthetics didn't matter at all. Because in his poem, what he's doing is there is a beautiful, sometimes mesmerizing, coming together of all those elements. And that's what Shahid's, one of the strengths in Shahid's work is this, yeah. that the, politic, the, the, the political and the aesthetic can be part of the same text. In, 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 in wonderful ways, as we all, all know. He had no doubt what he was doing. It's only later when, when, you know, when, when official narratives uh, become contested, when narratives oppose each other, uh, when there is a war of narratives, then people will obviously lay claim to Shahid as the national poet, and others will say, actually, he's, more of a, he's our poet, and he's more into aesthetics, he doesn't really about, care about Kashmir, and so on and so forth. Shahid belonged to neither camp. You know. He wrote what he wrote, but it was a response to what happened in Kashmir. Yeah. There is no doubt about this, unambiguous, his, his, his poems. They were a direct response and a profound response to that. Coming back to your question, when, we, when I'm growing up and you, there comes this person, this voice, and he uh, basically disturbs you a lot. He disturbs you more than you were disturbed previously. You hadn't made sense of what had happened to your world. You hadn't made sense of what was happening in your life because you're young and you're stupid in many ways. Um, and then uh, he arrives and I remember going to Srinagar once for my first book which had Shahid's poem on the, on, on, on the title page, inside title page. And I remember a man came to me and he said, I'm so glad to be here and very nice to meet you. Can I get a hug? And it, uh, it was a fun. 
uh, Irfan appears in Shahid's poems a lot. It's Shahid's friend, you know. Who, uh, and such is the love for Shahid in Kashmir. And it's not just a nationalist love. It's also the love for the poet. Because they own him, that there is this amazing, amazing... There's a friend of mine who likes to call Shahid Kashmir's finest literary export to the world. Mm -hmm. And most days I tend to agree, because it doesn't take into account our writers that came before Shahid, who wrote not in English, who wrote in Kashmiri, or back in the day, Kashmiri used to write in Persian and Urdu and Hindi, and back in the day in Prakrit and Sanskrit. But in the modern age, I tend to agree, he is our finest literary export to the world. And I'm, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, these days especially, if one were to uh, try and understand what has been going on in Kashmir, or what is going on at the moment in Kashmir, and what do Kashmiris make of all this? How do they live? How do they die? And how do they dream? Uh, how do they raise their children? Uh, one should read Shahid, not the security analysts we uh, hear on TV or who uh, hog our newspaper pages all the time, because they are, these days they're counting tanks, which has more, which country has more, which has more fighters and so on and so forth. But this man, I, infinitely, infinitely more profound in terms of an understanding if anyone hasn't read Shahid, now is the time to read Shahid in order to get a glimpse into, uh, into Kashmir. And, and, and as you mentioned, the terrible beauty is being born. And being there at all the time. Mm. Can I just read a yes. few lines? Yes. Um, we'll go past our ancestors up the staircase, holding their wills against our hearts. Their wish was we return forever and inherit that to which we belong. Mm. This is from um, a longer poem. Um, it's entitled A Pastoral. Um, and this, I think that something that uh, you've been talking about how while he's considered the national poet, he's not nationalistic and so on. Uh, um, I think that there is that sense that he is there and he's never there when it's all happening, as it were. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that location obviously doesn't have all that much to do with belonging. Uh, he was not born in Kashmir, he was born in New Delhi. Uh, he uh, grew up in Kashmir and then he went to America and, um, you know, um, I think that he was very much part of the, the tradition of American writers uh, at that point in time. Um, so, um, something else makes him uh, uh, Kashmiri. Um, and, and is it because he, in a sense, isn't there all the time uh, and wasn't there? And yet it is through his art that we do have a window that opens on to so many different aspects of Kashmir and, uh, you know, the sensuous beauty of it. And yet also the, 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 the terrible, uh, bloody uh, uh, history, uh, a new history of torments, uh, and, you know, every page is a new history of torments. Um, and also the fact that, again, uh, Kashmir then uh, encapsulates all the other terrible uh, events that have taken place. I mean, it's, it's now in history, but it's also all time. And again, I was reminded of um, uh, something that Walcott wrote in the Odyssey, and he writes, he says, Troy's wind has touched every island with its ashes. Mm -hmm. um, and that sense that, and, and of course he talks about women and ashes and how they are both burying their dead uh, and they are getting buried under the, 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 the burnt out buildings and so on, but they're also <coughs> embroidering. So mm -hmm. there is that sense of beauty and industry. Um, you know, the weaving of patterns, the weaving of cloth, uh, the, 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 the paisleys that appear so paisleys, many times in the The poem. sewing of shrouds, that, you know, shrouds too um, have to be wrapped. Uh, so all that, um, you know, he, he weaves into a, 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 a kind of um, a pattern for us. And, yeah, and, and how. One very brief point. You see, sometimes what happens is 
Uh, I, I'm asked this often these days because, you know, you are a writer, you are identified as being a writer from Kashmir, as a novelist from Kashmir, and then you're inevitably asked in the press, so, oh, so are you going to write about Kashmir all the time and, and things like that. And then you begin to get exasperated because uh, it is, as if to suggest that the story of Kashmir cannot encapsulate the entire human experience. Yes. But yeah. Shahid displays that remarkably, yes. that when he is talking literally zeros in on experience in the city, in the city, as if... It, enti- it encapsulates yes. the entire human experience. Yes. And, and that's where Shahid sort of also transcends Kashmir. That's right. So speaking of transcending, I wanted to ask Chris, um, so you were around him for the 20 years he was teaching in American schools and, and a, a major part of the American um, literary world. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the impact of, of his work and how it was inter- how it was understood. Uh, one thing I would note is that uh, on the question of writing about political issues, this is where he decisively broke with James Merrill. Uh, Merrill would look at his poems, and he had really no interest in the political matter. And Shahid uh, would take what J. M. had to say, and then he would ignore him. <laughs> Uh, because he was always doing what he he wanted to do. And I'm just thinking, uh, his impact on American poetry is that, first of all, every young poet in America writes guzzles now. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I said, I, I've often said it's, it's like that moment in English poetic history when the Italian sonnet washed up on the shores and you have... Uh, Thomas Wyatt and Shakespeare and Spencer and everybody writing sonnets. Now, we don't write sonnets so much in America, but we write guzzles. I mean, in a way, Shah had brought these two parts of his life together. Uh, The other thing he did, I might just note, is that it was interesting that he, when he wanted to write in a more formal fashion, he actually couldn't hear stresses in English. And we had many debates about uh, what how the the meter of a line was, what the rhythm was, and because he would write in syllabics, he could count to 10. And I would say to him, uh, there's a long poem for me in 10 syllable lines. And I said, well, it's funny, Shai, do you have four four or five iambic lines in a row? And then this is completely out of whack. And uh, he would say, I know, darling, that's how it is. (laughs) And I think what he did was he, he gave us a more elastic view of what the English language could do and what you might do with formal patterns. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, because it's, it, his first really great guzzle uh, begins, the only language of loss left in the world is Arabic. These words were said to me in a language not Arabic. And in the poem, he quotes uh, Muhammad Davish, the great Palestinian poet, Anton Shamas, an Israeli poet who wrote in both Hebrew and Arabic, and he ends with uh, Yehudi Amachai, the Israeli poet. So there was a way in which Shahid was never going to take one side or another if it would serve his poem to uh, uh, adopt a more comprehensive view. And the last, the the signature couplet has this wonderful line about, uh, they ask me to tell me what Shahid means. Listen, it means the beloved in Persian witness in Arabic. And I just thought it would be interesting for you to know how that came about for him to write that line. Derek Walcott, who's been mentioned many times here today, said said to him once, Shahid, what what does Shahid mean? And he said, oh, it means beloved in Persian, witness in Arabic. And and, uh, Walcott said, that sounds like something a woman would say. (laughs) And Shahid went, well? Shadab, I just wondered, you know, your thoughts about his impact and the impact of the American guzzle. So, very briefly, um, I, I want to talk about my um, my encounter with Agha Shahid Ali. I was supposed to meet him in the summer of 2000 at uh, Bread Loaf Conference, but I never did because he was sick and he didn't make it. Um, but when I was uh, an MFA student, um, I had the good fortune to be taught by 
his contemporaries and um, friends. And I wanted to, you know, uh, Mirza, you said something about being a beloved poet in um, Kashmir, and I want to say that he's also a very well-loved poet in America. And it's not just, it's not just the admiration that, um, that he gets, it's also um, the fact that I know, because I know so many poets who knew him very, very well. No, no, and the, he's loved yeah, in India. Uh, right. And, and Pakistan. But, and but because he, well, he's more ours because he, was, he <laughs> lived in America. <laughs> so, but, you know, because he has, um, um, he, you know, he was able to build these deep relationships. And Chris is here, and Chris knows, I, I know so many of my um, uh, friends and teachers who say, oh, well, he was a, he's, he's my friend, you know. I, so, so, um, so I wanted to say that um, he w was the kind of warm-hearted person who, who built these relationships. But uh, when I um, was at Warren Wilson, I began my um, Ghazal project, and I was asked by his uh, uh, contemporaries and his friends to begin that project. And uh, so it was, I was kind of commissioned to start this project. Um, and um, I built on that project, and my book, Ghazal Cosmopolitan, that just came out, um, is really a way of continuing his work on the Ghazal. And um, so he, he talked about the form, and I talk about the sensibility. So I sort of, I mean, I, uh, I, I talk about the craft, but I, you know, I, um, I'm continuing that um, whole conversation about how the Urdu Ghazal um, um, is um, now a part of, of, of the American canon. So the Ghazal is alive and well mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, before we open up for questions, we're going to hear one more um, citation of, of uh, Shahid's words. Shaista. Dear Shahid. Dear Shahid, I'm writing to you from your far off country far even from us who live here, where you no longer are. Everyone carries his address in his pocket so that at least his body will reach home. Rumors break on their way to us in the city, but word still reaches us from border towns. Men are forced to stand barefoot in snow waters all night. The women are alone inside, soldiers smash radios and televisions. With bare hands, they tear our houses to pieces. You must have heard Rizwan was killed, guardian of the gates of paradise, <clears throat> only 18 years old. Yesterday at Hideout Cafe, everyone there asks about you. A doctor who had just treated a 16-year-old boy released from an interrogation center said, I want to ask the fortune tellers, did anything in his line of fate reveal that the webs of his hands would be cut with a knife? This letter, inshallah, will reach you, for my brother goes south tomorrow where he shall post it. Here one can't even manage postage stamps. Today I went to the post office, across the river, bags and bags, hundreds of canvas bags, all undelivered mail. By chance, I looked down, and there on the floor, I saw this letter addressed to you. So I am enclosing it. I hope it's from someone you are longing for news of. Things here, as usual, though, we always talk about you. Will you come soon? Waiting for you is like waiting for spring. We are waiting for the almond blossoms. And if God wills, oh, those days of peace, when we were, we were, when we all were in love, and the rain was in our hands, wherever we went. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I add one quick thing? You know where that poem comes from? It was his deep reading of the Belgian surrealist Henri Michaud, and that's, I am writing to you from a far-off country. Shahid was such a magpie, and he would collect these lines, and that's what led him to then write the, a poem. Uh, Michaud's poem has nothing to do with politics, but Shahid managed to take 
uh, that line from Michaud and turn it into something altogether new. So I'm, I'm sorry, we only have a few minutes for questions, but if you raise your hand and, and if you'll uh, be sure that what you're providing is a question rather than commentary, that would be great. Uh, we have four wonderful people here, so um, just raise your hand and we have, oh, okay, yes. Hello, uh, I am from Kashmir and I was trying to experience the feeling behind those words and I was literally feeling uh, all those uh, feelings. But I was trying to uh, ask, uh, as you have uh, mentioned, that he was deeply impressed by the work of Dickinson. Can you speak up a bit? You need to get uh, my closer. As you, as you have mentioned that he was impressed uh, from the work of Emily Dickinson, uh, do you think he also draws in, uh, some inspiration from the uh, poets of same cultural heritage that uh, Major, Lila Arfa, or Hibahatu? Do you think he draws some inspiration from them also? I mean, I didn't either. Could you repeat that question? Uh, I was trying to ask that, uh, do you think that uh, Agashayat draws inspiration from the poets of same cultural heritage, Major, Lila Arifa, or uh, Hibahatun? Oh, so that's, okay. that's a question for you, Mirza. Kashmiri poets, Lala Arfa, and... Uh, yes, there's love that in his poetry. Yeah. It, you see, the, 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 the most dazzling thing about Shahid's work is his influences are varied. Uh, but but the, one of the profound sources of his work remains Indic. And by Indic, I mean the larger sort of historical uh, heritage uh, that you have. So Laldad appears often uh, uh, in, in his poetry. And also, but because Shahid came from this uh, truly cosmopolitan background, so there, is, uh, there, is Bud there are Buddhist influences in his work, and there is Hindu influences in his work, uh, and Christian, uh, and of course Islamic heritage. So I wouldn't restrict Shahid's influence to a uh, one strand of, 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 of poetic tradition, uh, because he's so much more than that. Yeah. But he keeps going back to uh, those primary Kashmiri influences as well. So here, a reading. A reading. Just uh, I one more. Think. One more poem. Yes. One. Okay. Farewell. This is one of my favorite poems because this is where Shahid displays that he can do magic with politics and beauty together, in two lines. At a certain point, I lost track of you. They make a desolation and call it peace. Mm. When you left, even the stones were buried. The defenseless would have no weapons. When the ibex rubs itself against the roads, who collects its, who collects its fallen fleece from the slopes? O oh, weaver, and what Shada was talking about earlier, who seems perfectly vanished, who weighs the hairs on the jeweler's balance? They make a desolation and call it peace. Who is the guardian of the gates of paradise? My memory is again in the way of your history. This is one of his most famous lines. And would Chris, do you remember how this line came about? <laughs> My memory is again in the way of your history. Okay. So Shahid had this Shahid's great friend Patricia O'Neill, who who you know who uh, help, has helped build a uh, arch of Shahid's archives at, uh, at Amherst. Uh, Shahid heard her speak this line, a version of this line in in her kitchen, and he deploys it so wonderfully in his part of this poem. It was a casual remark somebody made in someone's kitchen, and Shahid, what you mentioned earlier, he just. Worked it in. My memory is again in the way of your history. Army convoys. This is what I love the most about what Shahid does. My memory is again in the way of your history. Army convoys all night like desert caravans. In the smoking oil of dimmed headlights, time dissolved. All winter is crushed fennel. We can't ask them, are you done with the world? In the lake, the arms of temples and mosques are locked in each other's reflections. Have you soaked saffron to pour on them when they are found like this centuries later in the country I have stitched to your shadow? In this country, we stepped out with doors in our arms 
Children run out with windows in their arms. You drag it behind you in its corridors. If the switch is pulled, you'll be torn from everything. At a certain point, I lost track of you. You needed me. You needed to perfect me. In your absence, you polished me into the enemy. Your history gets in the way of my memory. I am everything you lost. You can't forgive me. I am everything you lost, your perfect enemy. Your memory gets in the way of my memory. This is where Shahid talks about the Kashmiri pundits, his friends who, had, who left Kashmir, sadly, in an exodus. So, so Shahid, as, as Chris mentioned, he's all those things together. Thank okay. you.